Dad and Mother thought they would mooch about a bit, and strolled into Queen Street. They stood at the courier corner for half an hour, staring in wonder. The people, the traffic, trams going and trams coming, and the roar and rattle of it all bewildered them. Dad confessed that Brisbane had changed a bit since he knew it fifty years ago. They strained their eyes and ears, trying to absorb everything, and got headaches. Look here, look here, look here. Eighteen lovely apples for one shilling and put them in a bag. Dad felt his pocket. Twenty newsboys rushed him, pushing and scrimmaging, shoving their wares into his hands and into his face and claiming his custom. Mother smiled compassionately on Dad and they both moved with the throng. A female astride a bike attracted Dad. He grabbed Mother by the arm. Look at that one, he exclaimed and both of them stood staring and grinning after the wheeling female until she was lost to them in the traffic. Three more pedalled past. Another, Dad gasped, tugging violently at Mother again. Two, three of them be damned. The excitement was too much for Dad. He was compelled to rest. He leaned against a veranda post and reflected on the scene around. Never seen the like, he said to Mother. They're thicker than wallabies. And a cheerful growl rumbled from him. They walked Queen Street most of the day and went without lunch. Dad was not a success on the pavement. The city people claimed all the space. They got in his way, pushed him about, collided with him, and whenever he stood a moment to stare back at anything, they carried him off his feet. Dad got sick of it all and took to the street. The street was wider and more in Dad's line. He got on well there, could see everything, and was striding along, his hands locked behind his back, one eye on Mother, the other on some girls hanging out of a window in a top story, when a bus driver yelled, Hey there! Hey! and cracked his whip. Dad felt the moist breath of a broken-winded horse on his neck, and had just danced safely to one side when a fat, perspiring female moving in the same direction on a bike, spurted to pass the bus and drove her front wheel fair between Dad's legs and lifted him up in front of her. Then, like a woman, she let the handles go and screamed and turned the bicycle over on the wood blocks and mixed Dad up in her skirts. Dad was more bewildered than ever. He didn't know what had attacked him until he regained his feet. Then he scowled on the fallen female, struggling and kicking at the machine like a horse in a fence and clutching her skirts to hide her great black stockinged calves, and said, One of them damn things, and returned to the footpath. Dad joined Mother again, and together they purchased some fruit and explored George Street. Several barristers wearing wigs, their gowns ballooning in the wind, issued from the Supreme Court and swept by. Mother watched them till they were swallowed up in Burnett Lane, then said she supposed they would be bishops. Dad shook his head. Might be judges, he remarked. Ain't bishops or they'd be in tights. Assembled at the gates of the courts were a number of legal lights. Among them, Dad recognised the lawyer from the boarding house. Dad was delighted. Hello, he said. This way you are. The law resented Dad with a look. But looks were nothing to Dad. The rest of the fraternity smiled and smoked. Have some of these, Dad said, producing a fistful of bananas from a large brown paper parcel that Mother was hugging. The lawyer frowned. No thanks, he snapped, turning his back on Dad. Put them in your pocket, said Dad amiably, proceeding to load his reluctant beneficiary with the fruit. Fire flashed from the lawyer's eyes. He drew back fiercely and shouted, Go to the devil! His learned brethren laughed and they all moved away, leaving Dad staring perplexedly at Mother. Dad and Mother got tired of the streets and made their way back to the boarding house. Dad took the lead and found Wickham Terrace without any trouble. Dad was a good bushman. The bump of locality was strong in Dad. Then he stalked into a private dwelling courageously, dragging Mother after him, wandered among the furniture looking for the stairs, and alarmed the inmates. A man with a capacious stomach hanging to him like a staghorn and wearing glasses came and saw them both off the premises again 
and remained on the steps till they closed the gate and departed. Mother remonstrated with Dad in the street for being a stupid. I could have sworn that were it, Dad said, staring back at the place. Then, after eyeing a house a few doors up, Ah, this is the one. He placed his hand on the gate and opened it eagerly. Mother hesitated. She wasn't going to follow Dad any more. She wasn't quite sure of him. Dad chuckled. You're bushed, he said, mounting the steps heavily and striding in at the open door. Inside, Dad saw himself revealed in a large mirror and was confused. He stood staring and trying to remember the surroundings. Well, from a sonorous voice in a corner of the room, Dad glanced around and saw another fat man with glasses on, looking hard at him from behind a book. Ain't this Mrs. Brown's boarding house? Dad asked. Three doors up, the voice said. Damn it, Dad said and rushed out. Finally, Mother recognised Mary grinning from a balcony. Then Dad knew the place and rejoiced. They wandered in and mounted the stairs and found their room. Dad said he would have a wash. He threw off his coat and shirt and splashed and bubbled noisily in a basin and made a great mess of the wall and the floor. When he dried himself, he pulled his boots off and, like a horse that's been ploughing or ridden hard all day, rolled heavily on the bed and groaned. He had scarcely stretched himself when Mrs Foley, pale and looking as though she'd seen a ghost or buried a boarder, appeared at the door of the room and asked Dad if he'd thrown any water over the balcony. No, Dad answered, sitting up. Only what I just washed myself in. Good gracious me, Mrs Brown exclaimed, putting her palms together. Then it went all over a lady and gentleman passing in the street. It did, Dad said, jumping up and going to the balcony for verification. Below, he saw a tall swell holding a wet silk hat in one hand, while with a handkerchief in the other, he mopped splashes from the skirts of a gorgeous female. At intervals, the swell glared wickedly at the walls of the house and made threatening remarks. What? Dad called out apologetically. Did that go on you? The swell looked up. Was it you who threw that water, fella? Dad turned to the room, snatched up the towel he'd dried himself in, and rolled it into a lump. Here, he shouted, hanging over the balcony again. Wipe her with that! And he threw the towel down. It opened in its flight like a fan, and spread itself over the swell's head and shoulders, and blindfolded him. Blackguard! the swell cried, dragging the moist rag from his head. Damn your insolence! And he looked up fiercely. John, the lady interposed, don't get exasperated, my dear. Damn! John! Then they moved away and left Dad staring from the balcony. End of section 3 Recording by Son of the Exiles